Chapter Eleven, Part One of All in the Day's Work by Ida Tarbell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A captain of industry seeks my acquaintance. As Stephen's case shows, there was always much fingering of a subject at McClure's before one of the staff was told to go ahead. The original hint might come from Mr. McClure's overflowing head and pocket, Mr. Phillips' notebooks, as much a part of him as his glasses, the Daily Mail the chance word of a caller we all turned in our pickings they must concern the life of the day that which was interesting people an idea once launched grew until fixed on somebody and once started it continued to grow according to the response of readers no response no more chapters a healthy response as many chapters as the material justified it was by this process that my next long piece of work came into being the history of the standard oil company the deluge of monopolistic trusts which had followed the close of the spanish-american war and the return of prosperity was disturbing and confusing people it was contrary to their philosophy their belief that given free opportunity free competition there would always be brains and energy enough to prevent even the ablest leader monopolizing an industry what was interfering with the free play of the forces in which they trusted they had been depending on the federal anti-trust law passed ten years before was it quite useless it looked that way there was much talk in the office about it and there came to the top finally the idea of using the story of a typical trust to illustrate how and why the clan grew how about the greatest of them all the standard oil company i suppose i must have talked rather freely about my own recollections and impressions of its development it had been a strong thread weaving itself into the pattern of my life from childhood on i had come into the world just before the discovery of oil the land on which i was born not being over thirty miles away from that first well the discovery had shaped my father's life rescuing him as it did thousands of others from the long depression which had devastated the eighteen fifties i had grown up with oil derricks oil tanks pipelines refineries oil exchanges i remembered what had happened in the oil region in eighteen seventy two when the railroads and an outside group of refiners attempted to seize what many men had created it was my first experience in revolution on the instant the word became holy to me it was your privilege and duty to fight injustice i was much elated when not so long afterwards i fell on rousseau's social contract and read his defense of the right to revolt i had been only dimly conscious of what had happened in the decade following the decade in which the standard oil company had completed its monopoly it was the effect on the people about me that stirred me the hate and suspicion and fear that engulfed the community i had been so deeply stirred by this human tragedy as i have told that i had made a feeble and ineffectual attempt to catch it fix it in a novel the drama continued to unfold while i was abroad came into our very household when a partner of my father's ruined by the complex situation shot himself leaving father with notes to pay them it was necessary in the panic of ninety three to do what in his modest economy was unsound and humiliating mortgage our home while the personal tragedies came in my mother's letters my brother wrote me vivid accounts of what was going on in the outside oil world of the slow action of the interstate commerce commission from which all independents had hoped so much of businesses ruined while they waited for the decision of the ohio suit which drove the trust to reorganization a legal victory which in no way weakened its hold or crippled its growth depressing as this was i was elated by my brother's report of the growing strength of a strongly integrated cooperative effort of producers refiners transporters marketers the pure oil company the only escape possible for those who would do independent business he argued ably was to build their own combination depending less on agitation 
politics legislation more on sound business fight if necessary but above all do business while i was still in paris this clutter of recollections impressions indignations perplexities was crystallized into something like a pattern by henry d lloyd's brilliant wealth against commonwealth i had been hearing about the book from home but the first copy was brought me by my english friend h wickham steed who fresh from two years contact with german socialism took the work with great seriousness was not this a conclusive proof that capitalism was necessarily inconsistent with fair and just economic life was not socialism the only way out as lloyd thought i was more simple-minded about it as i saw it it was not capitalism but an open disregard of decent ethical business practices by capitalists which lay at the bottom of the story mr lloyd told so dramatically the reading and discussions whetted my appetite and when i came back to america in eighteen ninety four and heard anew in the family circle of what had been going on my old desire to get the drama down seized me where were those notes i had made back in my chautauquan days gathering dust in the tower room i looked them up saw that i had done well in choosing pithole for my opening scene nothing so dramatic as pithole in oil history how many men it had made and ruined but the bottom had dropped out in eighteen sixty six what was left of it now eighteen ninety four my brother and i drove over to see thirty years before pithole had been a city of perhaps twenty thousand men and women with all the equipment for a permanent life now here were only stripped fields where no outline of a town remained we spent a long day trying to place the famous wells to fix my father's tank shops so profitable while pithole lasted to trace the foundations of the bonta house which had furnished the makings of our home in titusville the day left us with a melancholy sense of the impermanence of human undertakings and more to the point it showed me that if i were to reconstruct the town with its activities and its people picture its rise and its fall i must go back to records maps reminiscences that i must undertake a long and serious piece of investigation before i began but given the material how about my ability to make it live to create the drama which i felt one must be an artist before he can create that i knew i was no artist mr mcclure's call to come on and write a life of napoleon put an end to my hesitations and napoleon done there had been lincoln and the spanish-american war no time to consider oil or even to rejoice over the final success of the integrated industry to which my brother had tied his fortune but here i was again faced with the old interest the desire to do something about it get down what i had seen seized me was it possible to treat the story historically to make a documented narrative the more i talked the more convinced i was that it could be done but to tell the story so that other people would read it was another matter mr phillips finally put it up to me to make an outline of what i thought possible we couldn't go ahead without mr mcclure's approval and he was ill in europe with all his family go over said john phillips show the outline to sam get his decision and so in the fall of eighteen ninety i went to lausanne in switzerland to talk it over with mr mcclure a week would do it i thought but i hadn't reckoned with the mcclure method don't worry about it said he i want to think it over mrs mcclure and you and i will go to greece for the winter you've never been there we can discuss standard oil in greece as well as here if it seems a good plan you can send for your documents and work in the pantheon and he chuckled at the picture almost before i realized it we were headed for greece via the italian lakes milan and venice in milan mr mcclure suddenly decided that he and mrs mcclure needed a cure before greece and headed for the ancient watering-place of salso maggiore 
here in the interval of mud baths and steam soaks and watching such magnificent humans as cecil rhodes and his retinue recuperating from their latest south african adventure we finally came to a decision i was to go back to new york and see what i could make of the outline i had been expounding greece was to be abandoned leaving mr and mrs mcclure to finish their cure i headed for new york to write what as far as title was concerned certainly looked like a doubtful enterprise for a magazine like mcclure's the history of the standard oil company mcclure's has courage how often that remark was made after our undertaking was under way but courage implies a suspicion of danger nobody thought of such a thing in our office we were undertaking what we regarded as a legitimate piece of historical work we were neither apologists nor critics only journalists intent on discovering what had gone into the making of this most perfect of all monopolies what had we to be afraid of i soon discovered however that if we were not afraid i must work in a field where numbers of men and women were afraid believed in the all-seeing eye and the all-powerful reach of the ruler of the oil industry they believed that anybody going ahead openly with a project in any way objectionable to the standard oil company would meet with direct or indirect attack examination of their methods had always been objectionable to them go ahead and they will get you in the end i was told by more than one who had come to that conclusion either from long observation or from long suffering even my father said don't do it ida they will ruin the magazine it was a persistent fog of suspicion and doubt and fear from the start this fog hampered what was my first business making sure of the documents in the case i knew they existed almost continuously since its organization in eighteen seventy the standard oil company had been under investigation by the congress of the united states and by the legislatures of various states in which it had operated on the suspicion that it was receiving rebates from the railroads and was practicing methods in restraint of free trade in eighteen seventy two and again in eighteen seventy six it was before congressional committees in eighteen seventy nine it was before examiners of the commonwealth of pennsylvania and before committees appointed by the legislatures of new york and ohio for investigating railroads its operations figured constantly in the debate which led up to the creation of the interstate commerce commission in eighteen eighty seven and again and again since that time the commission had been called upon to examine directly or indirectly into its relations with the railroads in eighteen eighty eight in the investigation of trusts conducted by congress and by the state of new york the standard oil company was the chief subject for examination in the state of ohio between eighteen eighty two and eighteen ninety two a constant warfare was waged against the standard in the courts and the legislature resulting in several volumes of testimony the legislatures of many other states concerned themselves with it this hostile legislation compelled the trust to separate into its component parts in eighteen ninety two but investigation did not cease indeed in the great industrial inquiry conducted by the commission appointed by president mckinley the standard oil company was constantly under discussion and hundreds of pages of testimony on it appear in the nineteen volumes of reports which the commission submitted this mass of testimony most if not all of it taken under oath contained the different charters and agreements under which the standard oil trust had operated many contracts and agreements with railroads with refineries with pipelines and it contained the experiences in business from eighteen seventy two up to nineteen hundred of multitudes of individuals these experiences had exactly the quality of the personal reminiscences of actors in great events with the additional value that they were given on the witness stand and it was fair therefore to suppose that they were more cautious and exact in statement than are many writers of memoirs these investigations covering as they did all of the important steps in the development of the trust included full accounts of the point of view of its officers in regard to that development 
as well as their explanations of many of the operations over which controversy had arisen aside from the great mass of sworn testimony accessible to the student there was a large pamphlet literature dealing with the different phases of the subject as well as files of the numerous daily newspapers and monthly reviews supported by the oil region in the columns of which were to be found not only statistics but full reports of all controversies between oil men but the documentary sources were by no means all in print the standard oil trust and its constituent companies had figured in many civil suits the testimony of which was in manuscript in the files of the courts where the suits were tried i had supposed it would be easy to locate the records of the important investigations and cases but i soon found i had been too trustful for instance there was a federal investigation of the south improvement company the first attempt to make a hard and fast alliance between oil-bearing railroads and oil refiners an alliance which inevitably would kill everybody not admitted since by the contract the railroads not only allowed the privileged refiners a rebate on all their shipments but paid them a drawback on those of independence the railroads also agreed to give them full information about the quantity and the destination of their rival shipments the standard oil company as a monopoly had grown out of this pretty scheme where could i get a copy of that investigation more than one cynic said you'll never find one they have all been destroyed when i had located copies in each of two private collections i was refused permission to put my hands on them to be sure i did by persistent searching find that so guarded investigation in a pamphlet which was one of the three which are all i know to be in existence i am not supposing that there are not others for i quickly learned when i was told that the entire edition of a printed document had been destroyed to go on looking once a document is in print somewhere some time a copy turns up however small the edition for instance there was the important hepburn investigation of the relations of railroads and private industries made by the state of new york in eighteen seventy nine i could not find a copy in the oil region where i was working the standard had destroyed them all i was told at that time there was in the public library of new york city one of the ablest of american bibliographers adelaide haas she had helped me more than once to find a scarce document how about this hepburn investigation i wrote miss haas here in the library for your use whenever you will come around but she added only one hundred copies were ever published it is a scarce piece i have known of a complete set selling for one hundred dollars it was understood at the time she explained that one or two important railroad presidents whose testimony was given before the committee bought up and destroyed as many sets as they could obtain in the end all the printed documents were located but where was the unprinted testimony taken in lawsuits had incriminating testimony been spirited away from the court files henry lloyd made such an accusation in his first edition of wealth against commonwealth it disappeared from a second edition i wrote to ask him why the testimony was put back after my first book appeared he answered i was particularly anxious to have the original of one of these documents but when i came to look for it it was not in the files where was it how was i to locate it and if i did succeed would there be any chance to judge from past experience that it would be turned over to me i saw that i must have an assistant someone preferably in cleveland ohio so many years the headquarters of the standards operations it meant more expense and i was already costing the office an amount which shocked my thrifty practice but mr mcclure and mr phillips being generous and patient and also by this time fairly confident that in the end we should get something worth while told me to go ahead i had learned in my lincoln work that an assistant even if faithful and hard-working may be an encumbrance when it comes to investigation it needs more than accuracy it needs enthusiasm for finding out things solving puzzles anybody's puzzles 
i wanted a young man with college training a year or two of experience as a reporter intelligent energetic curious convinced everything he was asked to do was important even if he did not at the moment know why he must get his fun in the chase you in the bag also he must be trusted to keep his mouth shut i can recommend the technique i practiced in this case for finding my rare bird from each of three different editors in cleveland i asked the name of a young man whom he thought competent to run down a not very important looking bit of information to each of the names given me i wrote instructions from new york i would be around soon to pick up the report i told them adding that i should prefer that he say nothing about the assignment when i went to cleveland to view my prospects i found both number one and number two fine intelligent fellows their reports were excellent but they had not the least interest in what they had done i thanked them paid them and said good day the third young man came short and plump his eyes glowing with excitement he sat on the edge of his chair as i watched him i had a sudden feeling of alarm lest he should burst out of his clothes i never had the same feeling about any other individual except theodore roosevelt i once watched the first roosevelt through a white house musicale when i felt his clothes might not contain him he was so steamed up so ready to go attack anything anywhere the young man gave me his report but what counted was the way he had gone after his material his curiosity his conviction that it was important since i wanted it i thought i had my man a few more trials convinced me that john m siddle was a find he at that time was an associate of frank bray in the editing of the chautauquan the headquarters of which had been shifted to cleveland from meadville when siddle once understood what i was up to he jumped at the chance went to work with a will and stayed working with a will until the task was ended he was a continuous joy as well as a support in my undertaking nothing better in the way of letter writing came to the mcclure's office in time everybody was reading siddle's letters to me whether it was a mere matter of statistics or a matter of the daily life in cleveland of john d rockefeller the head of the standard oil company if anything in or around ohio interested the magazine the office immediately suggested ask sid and sid always found the answer mr mcclure and mr phillips began to say we want sid as soon as you are through with him sid saw the opportunity and as soon as i could spare him in ohio he joined the mcclure's staff i had been at work a year gathering and sifting materials before the series was announced very soon after that mr mcclure dashed into the office one day to tell me he had just been talking with mark twain who said his friend henry rogers at that time the most conspicuous man in the standard oil group had asked him to find out what kind of history of the concern mcclure's proposed to publish you will have to ask miss tarbell mr mcclure told him would miss tarbell see mr rogers mark twain asked mr mcclure was sure i would not ask anything better which was quite true and so an interview was arranged for one day early in january of nineteen o two at mr rogers home then at twenty six east fifty seventh street i was a bit scared at the idea i had met many kinds of people but this was my first high-ranking captain of industry was i putting my head into a lion's mouth i did not think so it had become more and more evident to me that any attempt to bite our heads off would be the stupidest thing the standard oil company could do its reputation being what it was it was not that stupid i told myself however it was one thing to tackle the standard oil company in documents as i had been doing quite another thing to meet it face to face and then would mr rogers come across could i talk with him so far my attempts to talk with members of the organization had been failures i had been met with that formulated chatter used by those who have accepted a creed a situation a system to baffle the investigator trying to find out what it all means 
my nervousness and my scepticism fell away when mr rogers stepped forward in his library to greet me he was frank and hearty plainly he wanted me to be at ease in that way he knew that he could soon tell whether it was worth his while to spend further time on me or not henry rogers was a man of about sixty at this time a striking figure by all odds the handsomest and most distinguished figure in wall street he was tall muscular lithe as an indian there was a trace of the early oil adventure in his bearing in spite of his air of authority his excellent grooming his manner of the quick-witted naturally adaptable man who has seen much of people his big head with its high forehead was set off by a heavy shock of beautiful gray hair his nose was aquiline sensitive the mouth which i fancy must have been flexible capable both of firm decision and of gay laughter was concealed by a white drooping moustache his eyes were large and dark narrowed a little by caution capable of blazing as i was to find out shaded by heavy gray eyebrows giving distinction and force to his face i remember thinking as i tried to get my bearings now i understand why mark twain likes him so much they are alike even in appearance they have the bond of early similar experiences mark twain in nevada henry rogers in the early oil regions when and where did your interest in oil begin mr rogers asked as he seated me a full light on my face i noticed on the flats and hills of rouseville i told him of course he cried of course tarbell's tank shops i knew your father i could put my finger on the spot where those shops stood we were off we forgot our serious business and talked of our early days on the creek mr rogers told me how the news of the oil excitement had drawn him from his boyhood home in new england how he had found his way into rouseville gone into refining he had married and put his first thousand dollars into a home on the hillside adjoining ours it was a little white house he said with a high peaked roof oh i remember it i cried the prettiest house in the world i thought it it was my first approach to the gothic arch my first recognition of beauty in a building we reconstructed the geography of our neighborhood lingering over the charm of the narrow ravine which separated our hillsides a path on each side up that path mr rogers told me i used to carry our washing every monday morning and go for it every saturday night probably i've seen you hunting flowers on your side of the ravine how beautiful it was i was never happier could two strangers each a little wary of the other have had a more auspicious beginning for a serious talk for what followed was serious with moments of strain what are you basing your story on he asked finally on documents i am beginning with the south improvement company he broke in to say well that of course was an outrageous business that is where the rockefellers made their big mistake i knew of course that mr rogers had fought that early raid tooth and nail and i also knew that later he had joined the conspirators as the oil region called them in carrying out point by point the initial program but i did not throw it up to him why did you not come to us at the start mr rogers asked it was unnecessary you have written your history besides it would have been quite useless i told him we've changed our policy he said we are giving out information as a matter of fact mr rogers may be regarded i think as the first public relations counsel of the standard oil company the forerunner of ivy lee and i was so far as i know the first subject on which the new policy was tried in the close to two hours i spent that afternoon with henry rogers we went over the history of the oil business we talked of rebates and pipelines independent struggles and failures the absorption of everything that touched their ambition he put their side to me the mightiness of their achievement the perfection of their service also he talked of their trials the persecution as he called it by their rivals the attack of lloyd i never understood how harper could have published that book why i knew harry harper socially 
there has always been something he said a little ruefully look at things now russia and texas there seems to be no end of the oil they have there how can we control it it looks as if something had the standard oil company by the neck something bigger than we are the more we talked the more at home i felt with him and the more i liked him it was almost like talking with mr mcclure and mr phillips finally we made a compact i was to take up with him each case in their history as i came to it he was to give me documents figures explanations and justifications anything and everything which could enlarge my understanding and judgment i realized how big a contribution he would make if he continued to be as frank as he was in this preliminary talk i made it quite clear to him however that while i should welcome anything in the way of information and explanation that he could give it must be my judgment not his which prevailed of course mr rogers i told him i realize that my judgments may not stand in the long run but i shall have to stand or fall by them well he said as i rose to go i suppose we'll have to stand it would you be willing to come to my office for these talks it might be a little more convenient certainly i replied he looked a bit surprised will you talk with mr rockefeller certainly i said well he said a little doubtfully i'll try to arrange it for two years our bargain was faithfully kept i usually going to his office at twenty six broadway that in itself at the start for one as unfamiliar as i was with the scenes and customs of big business was an adventure my entrance and exit to mr rogers office were carried on with a secrecy which never failed to amuse me the alert handsome business-like little chaps who received me at the entrance to the rogers suite piloted me unerringly by a route where nobody saw me and i saw nobody into some small room opening on to a court and it seemed never the same route i was not slow in discovering that across the court in the window directly opposite there was always stationed a gentleman whose head seemed to be turned my way whenever i looked across it may have meant nothing at all i only record the fact the only person besides mr rogers i ever met in those offices was his private secretary miss harrison a woman spoken of with awe at that date as having a ten thousand dollar salary one who knew her employer's business from a to z and whom he could trust absolutely she radiated efficiency business competency along with her competency went that gleam of hardness which efficient business women rarely escape miss harrison appeared only on rare occasions when an extra document was needed she was as impersonal as the chairs in the room we discussed in these interviews with entire frankness the laws which they had flouted i could not shock mr rogers with records not even when i confronted him one day with the testimony he had given on a certain point which he admitted was not according to the facts he curtly dismissed the subject they had no business prying into my private affairs as for rebates somebody would have taken them if we had not but with your strength mr rogers i argued you could have forced fair play on the railroads and on your competitors ah he said but there was always somebody without scruples in competition however small that somebody might be he might grow there it was the obsession of the standard oil company that danger lurked in small as well as great things that nothing however trivial must live outside of its control these talks made me understand as i could not from the documents themselves the personal point of view of independence like mr rogers who had been gathered into the organization in the first decade of monopoly making for instance there was mr rogers reason for desiring the trust agreement made in eighteen eighty two by eighteen eighty said mr rogers i had stock in nearly all of the seventy or so companies which we had absorbed but the real status of these companies was not known to the public in case of my death there would have been practically no buyer except mr flagler mr rockefeller and a few others on the inside my heirs would not have reaped the benefit of my holdings the trust agreement changed this 
the public at once realized the value of the trust certificate that is my estate was guarded in case of my death he often emphasized the part economies had played not only in building up the concern but in their individual fortunes economies in putting their money back into the business we lived in rented houses and saved money to buy stock in the company he told me once only one who remembers as i do the important place that owning your own home took in the personal economy of the self-respecting individual of that day can feel the force of this explanation i was curious about how he had been able to adjust his well-known passion for speculation with mr rockefeller's well-known antagonism to all forms of gambling didn't he object i asked oh he said a little ruefully i was never a favorite i suppose i was a born gambler in the early days of the charles pratt company the company of which i was a member i always carried on the speculations for the concern mr pratt said henry i haven't got the nerve to speculate i kicked all the clothes off last night worrying about the market give me the money i told him and i will furnish the nerve we simply raked in the money making a gesture with both hands and of course it came out of the producer that is what my father always said i told him one of the severest lectures he ever gave came from one of those booms in the market which sent everybody in the oil region crazy i suppose you were responsible for it i remember a day when the schools were practically closed because all the teachers in titusville were on the street or in the oil exchange everybody speculating i was in high school the fever caught me and i asked father for one hundred dollars to try my luck in the market he was as angry with me as i ever saw him no daughter of mine he said etc etc wise man mr rogers commented but it was not because he was so cautious i said it was because he thought it morally wrong he would no more have speculated in the stock market than he would have played poker for money i always play poker when the market is closed commented mr rogers i can't help it saturday afternoons i almost always make up a poker party and every now and then john gates and i rig up something he'll come around and say henry isn't it about time we started something we usually do all of these talks were informal natural we even argued with entire friendliness the debatable question what is the worst thing the standard oil company ever did only now and then did one of us flare and then the other generally changed the subject he's a liar and a hypocrite and you know it i exploded one day when we were talking of a man who had led in what to me was a particularly odious operation i think it is going to rain said mr rogers looking out of the window with ostentatious detachment end of chapter eleven part one